So I'm gonna get on Zoom on both because I wanna demo on each side. Let me get caption on. I know I can turn on the video. So it'll be rainy and cold. Let me minimize my share screen. Let me get on Zoom on this side. So I'll start in a second. Oh, did I not? Okay, sorry. Let me fix that real quick. Oh, I did publish it. Is it not available? Huh. on 41 i had it published let me see if it's if i didn't turn on the module because sometimes that happens oh yeah user error <laughs> sorry it I thought I clicked it, but I did, and maybe I just clicked on the outside. <laughs> okay, it should work now. I'm sorry. I, I was like, let me put this on for them to look at. Uh, my fault. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Hi, how are you doing? Good, thanks. So I don't have a microphone. Hopefully it's not echoey. Afonso, let me know if it's echoey because there's not a microphone on the desktop. Okay, so we are gonna work on the notes and the assignments. I am attempting to cover two chapters because there's 16 chapters in the book, right? I wanna make sure that you get through a big chunk of the main concept for the certification. Also, um, I just added you to skill sets online. This is a license that we bought um, for many years because I just found a bunch of money and I, I wanted to <laughs> use it. Uh, this is really good if you don't, you no longer have access to your course room on Canvas and the stuff that we use for the cloud. Um, what it is, is you have access to title for practice exam and labs um, from, and it's a vast. So they use Practice Lab along with other tools, um, as you can see. So they have like the CYSA, which is this course, and it starts with level one. So um, you can check out some of the Cloud Lab resources because I want you to have a more diverse understanding um, of how to use the tools because what I give you is, you know, what is used in the industry, but they also give you other good stuff. Okay. Um, so if you want to practice and study for certification like A+, Security+, Plus, Network+, Plus, um, I have the voucher for those. I'm working on the voucher for our class. Um, yeah, good. Congratulations. Or set. Thank you for being here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, if you need access voucher code, let me know. I need to use them by June. So otherwise, you know, I have to go back to CompTIA, bake and borrow and exchange. <laughs> so there are tons of stuff on here. There's some Cisco stuff on here. Um, they have a very diverse catalog, including cloud and AI and other things. So it's, it's worthwhile to check. It might go to your junk folder, by the way, because my students, they tell me that I just added a bunch of students. Um, it is a library system. So when you register for the course for, for a review, it is two weeks. So after that, you can just go back and re-add that class again, okay? Uh, because the way that they want to do it is that, so that way it will free up for other people who are using it. So that's that way they can save the cost. 
So it's actually very affordable, this particular product. And I was one of the, you know, I, I tap into this and I got everybody in the region using it. Um, so, you know, like Chafee's using it, but different licenses. So you should be able to, uh, to get access to this now. Okay. So, you know, Linux plus all that good stuff is on there. All right. So I just want to share that. Okay. Um, let's talk about our concept for today. We are going to cover, uh, threat intelligence and we are going to cover, uh, recon. Okay. Very important for ethical hacking and risk analysis. All right, cool. So I'm going to leverage between uh, my notes and my assignments. So there are two chapters in this particular week. So we'll try to get through and a lot of the exercises are really easy. So when we talk about threat intelligence is the, the basically the detailed understanding of the type of threats that you're facing in your organization right um it could be malware it could be people we talked about threat um in various parts last week so it's divided in three categories for cysa um you have the strategic threat which is going to be more of like a broader understanding of who those who are the things or which what what things and who are impacting your organization right? Could be internal threats, could be malware, it could be attacker from the outside. And then you have the tactical threat. So the technical attacker is really falling into this category. And then some of the malware falls into this category because it's behavior and technical base. And so this understanding or the intelligence of it will directly help you prepare, right? And respond to threats then you have the operational threat. And this is, needs to be very highly detailed and you need to know where it comes from, how, was, how it was modified, what is the functionality and the potential harm that's gonna cause the behavior. Some of it could be people, right? Um, and then how to prevent it. So we can't just have this knowledge in ourselves, right? We are gonna use sources that is built by the industry to be able to, to tap into this, to, the, to build the intelligence. So for your assignment, right? At the beginning, you just need to know those three, but you need to say when it is applied. So for the first category, as it is a broader understanding, it is useful when you are building your security plans or updating your security plans. And this also changes, right? Threats are very fluid. It could be this in one month or a year or, you know, the week, and it could be different in the next time that you reevaluate your plan. So this is why we don't just build a plan and implement it. We update our plan and maintain it. Then your tactical threat. So tactical threat are more detailed and that is more specific to the technical area that we're dealing with. It could be IoT related. It could be system or server related or database related. So this is when we are considering this type of knowledge when we're configuring security systems, when we're modifying our settings, when we're installing appliances and changing the settings to protect our network or our people. Then you have the operational threat. This is detail and it could change and the functionality could be varied. So understanding that is gonna help you in configuration, in defense or responding and to combat it, right? And so prevention is really the area that we should function in, but it's that's not always the case. That could be for business purposes, cost, or it could be the lack of resources, right? People, even knowledge or skills. So you need to understand when these things are applied for practical purposes and also for certification. Now, um, virus share is a very 
common platform for security professional to understand the type of malware that could be impacting the organization. So will you know everything in the field? No, right? You need to know the trends and that's the important part. So we are more open to what's available through, to us through these channels, these knowledge base. And we also need to be more cautious and, and pay attention to the media. Okay, so when you click this, it's gonna take you to virus share. And what I want you to do is, because usually they post the recently shared, right? This is a new one and it's impacting. So what you want to do is you want to look at the information. Sometimes they don't have a name yet, right? Usually that, remember I said at least 50% are known. So there are the unknown. And so people report the unknown and then they do the reverse engineering on it. Okay, so companies, organizations, and associations do that. So let me pull some of the other stuff here for 27 as I was helping a student. So what I want you to do is to record some of the information on your assignment, what you find from Wireshare. And you can simply copy and paste the hash. The reason why we want to look at that is a lot of the times you don't want to open up a malware, okay? You want to check its hash, the value that's given to that file. And a lot of the anti-malware, it's really good at detecting the unknown, right? It can't tell you what it is. It will try to quarantine or stop what's unknown. That And it would analyze based on behavior. So understanding what that is could potentially help us because somebody might download it. So once you have the information from the website, Right, and they give you a lot of information. The, the hashes, the mind type, it's coming in from a certain application, okay? And, and then the extension, it's executable. So here, we can't just glance at it. And then the detection, it's malicious. And it's related to Trojans. So Trojans really good at hiding things right? Things that looks very common to us. And so what you want to see is you want to see what kind of behavior or suspected behavior for this type of malware. So what I'm showing you here is how to stay current with your malware information. Okay. All right. Okay. So that type of information is considered thread feeds. And so when you use thread feeds, they can also, if you subscribe, they'll send you information, which is great, right? Um, I use a lot of stuff via LinkedIn as well. There are a lot of really great educational things that you can learn about new tools, new resources, new information. This field is about catching up, <laughs> right? So I put a bunch of links here for you. The book does a good job with giving you most of the links. I did add a lot of the stuff in addition to that, resources from the government, it's always good for related to cyber crime. Um, threat sharing is good, right? Not just for malware, there's also spam information and so on, right? A lot of the stuff is supported by the government. Some stuff is supported by the organization. So um, to the next one, right? For number three, it tells you to visit SISA. And this is government supported. A lot of it is documenting your vulnerabilities, okay? So when you visit the website, you can simply hit control and click. And here there are some information, new releases. They deal with a lot of the report for industrial system because if we are crippled in industrial system, we are gonna face a hard time right? Raw materials, resources for our people, uh, transportation, things like that, um, even on the grid, right? Uh, so industrial system is essential to a country and most organization. So they, they have released this, but the cool thing, what they did is they list the recent vulnerability and also rank it, which is, I think this is nice, right? Long ago, we didn't really have this so what I want you to do is when you take a look at this, 
um, you want to select a vulnerability, right? That is related to a network appliance. So look for Cisco links, uh, things that, you know, switches, routers, uh, you know, security appliance could be. Sometimes that's the case. And what we normally we are tagged those things by the VU number, vulnerability number, right? And then I don't need like two paragraph general description. The point in this is to give you an overall understanding, right? And you can go in depth in the research, okay? Now, every software company or firmware company, they tag things by CVE, common vulnerability entries. This is how they document, right, issues with software could relate to zero days and other things. So you know that hardware needs software to be used. So you always want to have some kind of related information, what kind of impact. A lot of times they put a scale there for you. Is it highly impacted, medium impacted? We address the critical impact and then possible solution if there is any. So coming back to the website, if you look, right, um, there's email, there are other things. You can also, you know, go to the resources for the database if you can't find anything interesting. You know, I was on here, um, you know, this week. So yeah, it changes week to week. So here's the router. You can use the link routers. You can also get Netcom. Uh, so those are the two network appliances. And then if you, you're not happy with what you see there, you can go to additional resources. So let's go to this one. And so this is normally what they give you, okay? The VU number, uh, the release information for the date, the models that's impacted, that's really important. So if you have those models, you want to kind of look a little deeper and see what you need to do. So it has issues with buffer overflow. That's very common, okay? And, and then also access. If somebody can create a fake login, that's a big no-no, right? So ACL is probably an issue. So the solution is to download the firmware and patch it. And there are professionals, right, that contribute back to the knowledge. And that's what we want to do is when you find something, you want to share it. You want to be able to give it back to the community so somebody can use that, right? And there are communities that you can tap into. And so there are some other, right, technology that would be, in, be related and impacted. So affected Netcom Wireless Limited and then you know unknown to some other electronics so that means that they're using hardware that's produced by the same manufacturer that's a very common thing okay yeah so hopefully right so with that what you have to do is now you have to manually figure out how you're going to fix it and then if you come up with the solution, you share it. But you will come back and see, or I would, I normally go to forums that help me. A lot of the times community and forums, because it takes time to publishing on these databases. So, you know, cause it has to go through testing and all of these things, they want to validate it. Uh, but there are professionals that share resources, you know, their temporary fix or their quick fix. And you can, you know, do the temporary fix until you can fix it permanently. And sometimes that's the case, right? It's broken, so. Okay, so that's some one of the things that we can tap into and that's the resources that you can use. So some of the Cloud Lab stuff, that's what they have you do anyway, okay? Um, so I put the link for there. Now in the next part, after you record it, um, I want you to go to Mandiant. And they had taken over in managing Open IOC. Um, these records use cases. Use cases are scenario that could be real or it could be for practical purposes in organizations 
that apply certain security measures, technologies, and resources. So that would see, I look at use cases as very useful to me because it allows me to compare, is my situation like this? Should I apply my solution the same way that they did? It gives you a better understanding of how practical things are, right? So in the use cases, what, what they recommend when you visit the website is you are gonna look at the use cases. How can you subscribe to the open IOC platform to gather the intelligence, okay? Um, you would, when you, when you use the use cases, you are gonna look at how you can apply this using binary files. So files come in different format. Right? The attributes are the properties or the characteristics of the file, such as timestamp, right? when it was modified, when it was originated, okay? the extension of the file, or the nature of the file. The binary files are on the low level. And that's what a lot of the, the malicious programs like to tap into, is to be able to capitalize on the system instruction that cannot be controlled by the user. So with that, when we, when we reverse engineer, a lot of the times we have to break it down to the binary files. So that means that your utility and your malware has to be broken down to the binary files. So when you build the intelligence, you need to really look at registry keys, especially for Windows because anything that's modified on hardware level and software level is done, is recorded in registry database, which is your system have keys, right? And it's value associated with that. You can also use run keys to identify malware and utility. So the feeds, you have to use multiple sources sometimes to identify IP addresses, okay? They report malicious IP addresses or source of origination because if it's being released from a certain server, it will, you know, system will pick it up, right? Your alarm will sound off or other people's alarm will sound off. So we have a way to report it. Then looking at your hash value, your malware utility, and then you also need to compare metadata. So your metadata, again, going back to your attributes of your files, the properties, the characteristics, really tags that are related. But the cool thing with metadata is that if it's image file, it'll tell you also geolocation, a lot of the things that you can investigate. So we use this to really look at how things are executed and how backdoors are installed. Okay, metadata is very important. So analysts, you're gonna get a bunch of data on CSV. So I'm gonna show you down the line when we run the suite, it's going to give you like massive data if it could find it, right? And you're going to have to comb through it. So you have to do use analysis tool to be able to visualize it, to be able to, this is when Python comes in hand, and R, okay? All right. So you can find the information on the website. It's a blog, right? So when you go through here, I actually took all of this and sized it down to what you see on your answers. It's a way that you can use the tool to be able to find things, right? That could be harmful. Okay, coming back. I know some of you are putting down your answer. So make sure we know what thread feeds are, right? how you access those things, what kind of information is gonna give you uh, through threat feeds. Analyst is, that's very useful for that, for your job and for certification. Then in the notes, it talks about threat life cycle, right? And this is really to build out intelligence life cycle. So, Today, this week, we're gonna focus a lot of it at the beginning stage, okay? So in the cycle, it maps out how each of the state would, stage would consist of different things. 
So you need to really gather information that's going to tell you the requirements. And how do we do that? We would base it on breaches, right? Attacks that happen, trends, current trends, or and sometimes that vary from organization to organization, depending on the industry, the type of organization, your operation, the resources. There's so many factors to consider. That's why this field is very specific because you, you can give solution for one and another company that's similar to it use another solution. Okay. And so it takes talent, right, to really see specific and patience and, and knowledge and skills. So your risk assessment results, remember we rank them, right? We give them scores, the high priority ones we address. So that's gonna feed back into the requirements. You need to collect data outside of the websites and the knowledge base and the database that's online. You need to talk to people. That's very important. I think interviewing people, give them questionnaire surveys. That's also a good way because people work with people and they what they they can quickly identify somebody that's inside, right? Um, so having the knowledge from the inside is important. Consolidate data for processing. So once you have data, data sets, so inputting the data into files and then you also clean data, consolidate data and then you analyze it, okay? There are automation tools that we use for this, but when you buy a security suite, so if you use SIEM or SIM system, it has the capability to do this, okay? Most of the solutions that are out there has these components. It will go and find intelligence for you, or we can have the Python script to do that. Put it into a CSV file, Feed it through a software and it will tell you these are the possible solutions. How do you want to implement it? Okay. And then the human is going to make the decision. So all of these AI equipped tools, great, right? It saves us time, but ultimately it still comes down to whoever that's making that decision. Sorry, let me move this down a little bit, right? We should be okay with the next one. And then um, distribute the data. You got to give it to your executives, right? Your personnel, security team, IT team, business people, finance people, because they supply the resource for you to maintain security solutions. And then you want to obtain feedback for future improvement. We will do that for everything that we do. So how can I get feedback? I can give them a survey. I can ask them, what can I do better? Do you, you know, and then you would analyze what your solution, how effective it is over time as well. Okay, any questions? Yeah. What type of requirements are required? So what, what's the goal for the requirements? The requirements to meet the the, uh, yeah, or sustain your security fabric or, you know, your, so some requirements are different than other, uh, a lot, some of the requirements is to be securing the operations, right? So that's your overall broader goal. Sometimes it could just be for a software project, right? Um, or an implementation or rollout. So for example, if I'm um, I'm going online, right? A lot of businesses lately, they are closing down the storefront because you're competing with online entities and then they're just strictly going online. And that transition is different because your security requirement for brick and mortar store is different than your online store, right? You're dealing with database, you're dealing with online customers, self-registration, you're dealing with, you know, like transaction, PCI, uh, DSS, processing transactional payments. So you have to have a third party vendor. So there are a lot of different elements, but if you're new to it, so let's say that I'm a medium-sized business, I'm going online. Um, 
I have never done online before. I never had breaches before. I won't have historical data. So you have to look at similar company and then you are going to look at the trends for that type of business. So a lot of it is, you know, this is when consultant like myself comes in, right? They would be like, I don't know anything about this. You tell me what I can do, right? What I need. And you would give them that, right? And then, you know, and then the cost. So they would say, oh, I can't afford this. Something better. It's like buying a car. You're like, oh, that that's too much. I want something a little bit less that's more affordable because I'm a, a, a small business or a medium business. So there are um, there are centers for specific industry. Fear less, right? You we want to. So they really break this into areas that you can focus in. So the reason why these things come up is historically those are highly impacted. So they built the centers around healthcare financial and aviation. But there are other type of industry, right? Like for that uses industrial system. What if you're in manufacturing, right? Uh, so ISACs really break it up into the three main categories and they have different links. Okay, for I for certification, you need to know these three. But as you can see, cybersecurity healthcare is very highly demanding. Financial system, everything we've done with, with electronic transaction, right, comes back to system maintenance and, you know, payments, banking, things like that. And then aviation. I think aviation has a lot to do with nation uh, welfare. It has a lot to do with, you know, the capability to maintain the safety of the country. Uh, not just, you know, people coming and leaving, but people traveling for work and, and so on. But outside of that, when you look at aviation, it's really about, you know, like military aviation. That's the focus, okay? But aviation is also important in transporting goods because we can't do by train. Train will be too slow for most part for ground or car. Um, so we do a lot of goods transfer through aviation. So that's why it's there too. So before we talked about the next part, let me come back to the notes and uh, touch back here. So I added some things for closed source, right? And then your confidence rating level, this is just an example. You don't have to follow this, but this is just a way that we can rank things. So how confident it is for the threat, right? If it's really proven, that's close to 100. Um, so you have a score system. And so if something is very doubtful, that's gonna be very low, like one and then two to 29 is, you know, so there's some description in that. There's a rating system. Also see the link there. Um, they talk about sticks. We need to know sticks, okay? Structured threat information expression. This is coming in as XML. So when you open this file, right, if you have Microsoft, it's, it's the spreadsheet, okay? But this is the type of data that's going to be given to you, right? It looks weird. Right. But what it is, is, you know, we can process this with JSON. So there are software tools that we would that would be able to digest this type of data. Analyst is about handling data. So very similar to sticks, you would have taxi. This is the protocol that is used specifically for how we share the information via the web HTTPS application layer. OK. And then that comes in using open OIC, right? Because a lot of the data would relate to your files that could be impacted by threats. And Mandiant now took over. I think in the past, that was another entity. Okay, here's your threat life cycle. Make sure we know this.
and then I said, so let's talk about actors. I think, you know, anytime that you learn security, they're going to start with talking about like threats and who are the actors. So there are four common categories, and this is going to come up on every security certification. Um, nation state, you hear a lot of talk in this. And for example, China versus US, North Korea versus us, uh, North Korea versus another nation. Um, so nation state, relates to organization or countries that have resources, tools, talents, equipment, and time. And it's often related to APT, advanced persistent threat. Those are groups they could relate to, they could work on organized crime, but not. They could be groups of attackers or individuals that build tools specifically target certain things, right? Uh, for example, um, Boeing or, you know, companies that produce goods um, and so on. So they are very advanced. And realistically, we are, professionals are usually behind APT, right? Um, the the talents really rely, it, they are in this group, okay? Because there's high money in that. Okay, so there are sponsored, you hear nation state sponsored individuals, that's, you know. Um, and then you have organized crime hacktivists like anonymous. There's a cost, political cost behind their action. So there's always rumors about anonymous being real security professional, their administrators, and I don't doubt it. It's a very large group. So, um, and then insider threats. Make sure we know the categories. So what type of threat actors have most resources? And in general, that's your nation state. They're able to sponsor, pay, build talent, sorry. Um, our NSA and FBI people, they investigate, Department of Defense, they regularly investigate what's going on with the other nation. Um, are they building a group of talents for cyber warfare? Okay. And then the type of threat actors that are dangerous because difficult to detect, that's your insider threat. It could be internal employee, right? Or partner or affiliated individuals, right? Sometimes that could be like temporary contractor or it could also be permanent workers. Okay, next part. So let's, before you record this, let's come back here real quick. So there are ways that we can classify the red. So that means that we put them in different classes, right? And the way that we would do that is to be able to set, a, set up a system so we can look at which class have more priority or which class fits a certain identity, okay? So here are Microsoft general classes. If it's spoofing or user identity, right? Like if I do IP spoofing, it will mean that. Tampering, repudiation. You, you guys know what repudiation means? So if non-repudiation means that you, you, you can't deny, right? Like, so for example, if I log into a system, it has my logs, right? It has the timestamp I log in. There's non-repudiation. Yeah, so it shows my account information. And so that means that I cannot repudiate, argue that I'm not, I wasn't the one that logged in. Right? Yeah. So repudiation just means that you do what? Yeah, like, didn't, yeah a denial or claim that you didn't do a certain action, right? Because there's evidence, right? You you go against the evidence. So the informal information disclosure, denial of service and ele elevation of privilege. So this is Microsoft, right? Um, classification. And there are many. Um, right. 
So how do attackers do that? So they have to cover their track, right? You don't want to get caught and go to court and be in prison forever. That's that's criminal. That's not what they want. So they cover their track. They delete things, right? If they install backdoor, they remove it because everything locks, right? So so you have to have multiple detection system, not just log, because log could be deleted. Okay. So for spoof of identity, IP and Mac spoofing impersonation, that could be physical too, right? Like I wear a badge and I just walk in and I wear a uniform. Um, I can impersonate your employee. Okay. Um, tampering if they delete or modify files or server objects, right? Or Websites, it could be making it unavailable, or, or most of the time that is the case, re remove availability. Corrupt the file. Repudiation, change or delete logs, because that is the evidence of something that, that happened, right? Information disclosure, distribute data on the dark web. That's one example. That could be accidental too, though. People can attach the wrong file and send it out, a bunch of identities or healthcare information to other people. Denial of service, we are very familiar with this, right? They can attack servers to make it unavailable to other users. So we can... You know, we, we see that people can ping them to death. They can just keep submitting tons and tons of requests. Cut the actual cable, right? That happened in the past. Elevation of privilege. This is a, a stage in the attack, right? Um, and we'll talk about that. So once they're in, they need to elevate. And when you perform your scan today, you are going to see that you can't do it as a regular user or, you know, you have to be a super user, right? You have to be a root actually to do that because you're accessing system level based uh, files. So why do we classify? There are two areas that we look at. If you use a common framework that's agreed, or standardized in the industry to describe the threats. It allows other people to share solutions, ideas, and it helps us manage the information better, right? Where we would group them and we would it would make sense. The second benefit is to have a knowledge that those threats exist and how to analyze them better because if you understand them likely that you will be able to analyze and deliver better solutions so it tells you here that it, you will be able to perform better analysis by understanding potential threat options So gathering intelligence, there are a lot of public information, much out there, right? Um, and then not just in social media, but on, you know, um, in United States, when government lists things publicly, right? People's income, uh, you know, um, contract information, whenever they release a contract at the federal level, or let's say like grant information, they actually have to list the details, right? Share that to the public. So we do a lot with how data is classified and then um, should certain things be publicly classified, right? So when you gather information, think about what's already out there. Simple Google, right? I love Google in that you can find anybody, anything. If you have time. Um, and then there are, I'm going to show you other engines that you can use. That's really cool. <laughs> Knowledge is power, right? How you use it is up to you. Okay. 
for the next part is that we are gonna talk a little bit about um how reputation plays a big key, especially on the enterprise and the server's end. Okay. So when we gather information, we go out there and we seek things like, oh, who owns that server, right? What's its IP address? Where is it physically located? And attackers do the same thing. Before they attack, they're going to do their homework, right? And yeah, yeah, footprinting, very good. You're remembering the terms or sometimes fingerprinting, depending on whatever that you're working on. Sometimes you think you got a lot of the details, but you you didn't, right? It, it's not useful. So, you know, that takes experience and also patience. Um, this is a, 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 you know, security looks very ideal on paper, but a lot of the times when people get out there and they do things and they're like, ah, oh, you know, it's not what I'm looking for. So you have to you have to think about like, and it's very rewarding when you find things and it's useful. You're like, yes right? A little bit more to go and it keeps you motivated. Sometimes it's a lot and and you have that one piece of information that's going to carry you through. Yeah. And you're on time crunch too. It's not like they give you unlimited time. They would be like, oh, you can assess my network in two days, right? So this is why you're like, oh, well, let's use all my laptops. Let's use, you know, let's use all the resources to be able to, you're going to scan, you're going to scan and you're going to look. And so the more tools that you know that's effective, the better, right? Because you don't want to just Google dork everything. All right, so here, let's go here. So ta Taylor's intelligence there, it's cool, okay? First, it checks to see if you're safe connecting. Um, then it lists all the IP and the domain and the reputation. And then it gives you the map for the threat data overview, which is good because it kind of gives you a broader view on, you know, where's the malware, where's the spam, um, who, which network. So most of the DNS out there is tied to a mail exchange server, right? Like Microsoft.com, Google.com, with hence Gmail, right? Um, so, and so what we want to do is we want to put in Google public IP. We can use Microsoft too. This is IPv4. Now, not all companies you can do this, right? Sometimes they block it. And we'll talk about that. So here it tells you that this is a public IP for your DNS Google. Your network owner is Google. Okay. They do, they did block, right? So they have a block list. And then it tells you the amount of email that comes through just for that server, though. Okay. Because remember, they have blocks. <clears throat> and their reputation is good. Okay, sometimes you see poor, depending on how they maintain, so. And then related addresses, okay? So here you can just give me a range. You can look at the range, okay? You know which one's the broadcast one. They do use the higher end, so that could be varied. So, you know, there are lots more so give me a rough range right they they maximize on public address that they own so i would not leave any empty space because <laughs> it's money um so there's some that are neutral right and then you can also like you know it gives you the volume and size so this type of stuff is good right especially when you're dealing with you know their mail uh resources and then there's also who is tab okay for aaron right um some of this information also can be shield so this is through the registration and then you look at the email volume so it gives you the historical stuff so stuff like uh, threats that coming in from email especially from a specific server we can research 
Oh, yeah. 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 There's automated tool for that. For example, like I can use Nike.com and it's going to find all the employees on the web that especially want to use LinkedIn, social media, that they claim that they work at Nike. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just a crawler. It goes through and it finds all the profiles. So that's profiling, right? When you profile a company and you profile an individual. So that's how, where you start. You start with the global and you narrow down to the, the, the individual. So you would see who's the easy target, which of these executives I can target, right? Um, so from the, the bad guy's lens, you know, the homework is, is, you know, abundant of information. You just got to do your homework. And when you get paid to ethical, to do ethical hacking, you have to perform like what they perform, right? And CYSA is some of that, a majority of that, right? You have to know ethical hacking. You have to know forensic. You have to get, you know, it's well-rounded. Okay. Um, so information. So I put down the host name, right? The domain, the network owner, IP reputation. That's good. Everybody know AAA, right? And then you can click on it, another link that I put there. There's another tab that you can use from the top. You can access the reputation center, which we did for the last exercise. You can also go to vulnerability. And then they also have a, a list of software. So what they, they do a good job at recording the reports um, and for the zero day. Okay, you can download it and read it, but here you can see. Okay, so what I want you to do is just to take a look at it. And then um, you can find a software vendor that reports on there. Some are hardware maker, right? So on the right, and if you're not sure, you can also search or click on their information. And like I said before, right, it goes in. So the way that they, they use the number, as you can see, is the year, right? And then the individual unique ID for that CVE. You can click on view all reports if you want to see more. So pick one. So let's say if I use Moxa, right? Uh, this is for web application. This is for ethernet switch, crafted for HTTP requests, it can lead to disclosure of sensitive information. So there's potential in packet crafting and uh, data leaking. That's, and then a lot of the times they recommend additional resources. A lot of it, you're gonna see that it's hardware related, EST soft, You can see killing target process, malicious file trigger, this vulnerability. You know, um, a lot of the PhDs, they go into research for security companies, right? Um, some of it is, you know, to take all of this and then build out some kind of solution. That's big money too. Okay. And then some of us just come back to teach. <laughs> I did ponder the thought if I go into R and D, you know, how interesting it would be. Sometime it could be breakthrough technology, though. You know, okay. <laughs> not until I graduate. That's what they all say. Just no. one more year. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the models now, right? As we get more into the uh threat research and modeling. So we talked about reputation. So modeling is really important because what you wanna do is you wanna look at adversary, attack surface, right? Your vector, which means how they can gain access, impact and likelihood. So that's our area of operation as security analysts. So we are going to talk about a couple of the well-known model, Mitre. This is very popular, 
right? Um, it lists the tactics, the techniques, the, the, the common knowledge in all OSs or the common ones at least. Um, and then your diamond model of intrusion analysis. So this is for analysis, for your assessment. Now, Lockheed Martin kill chain model, this is mostly focusing on the attack uh, faces, okay? So when you learn ethical hacking, it, this is the, the process, right? That's also a very popular model. So the for the analysts to really discover more information that is going to give you the relationship between the elements, right? The security elements of the events, the specific area of the events is going to be your diamond model. Because when you look at the diagram, this model, right, the diamond intrusion analysis model, this one, it's going to look at how you're using net block that's going to relate to adversary identity. So it's very specific. Okay, logs, right, for IP of the attacker. So there's relationship or association between those elements. So on this, this is where we operate on the blue team, right? This is where we are. They operate on the red team. Okay. All right. Now Lockheed, um, they have, and if you click this, it, I actually like their document. It has like, it's a PDF. It's their whole training on this. So you, if you want a better understanding of this model, this is the document. And it breaks it down to the details on like what you do, right, in, in each of the phases. Uh, most of the textbook use this, okay? But there are many different models that you can use. So the kill chain model. In Lockheed kill chain model, if you go through the document, you, how can you, I put a lot, right? Uh, you don't have to put verbatim, I think, if you have a good understanding of it, it's good. How can the professional detect and combat activities in the first stage? So you have to really look at what that first stage means. What are they doing, right? So in the first stage, it's recon. And that means that they're researching, they're, they're finding a target, right? Like I said, look at the world and look at the people inside that world. And then identify, single out your target, or if you want to sing target that world, then, you know, that's a bigger task. So once they gather the information and how can you gather the information, harvest email address, there are tools for that. Identify employees from social media, from Google. Collect press releases. What, what is available about on newspaper, magazine, or, you know, public information that can be useful to you. Awarded contracts, conference attendees. These are the things that you do in recon. So using one tool in recon barely cracked the surface. So in our lab today, I'm using a suite and I'm using another tool, right? But I, what I want to show you is that you can use technical tools, but a lot, a lot of it is sometimes you can pick up the phone and call, right, to get information. And then we can look at public servers, public VNS, things that can be seen publicly. So that requires scanning, passive scanning. And then you are going to, so within that, right, how can you detect? In, in detection recon, you can review logs, like website logs, alerts in your, system like IDS, IPS, and then look at their historical search, like search history. Then you can also use browser analytics because every 
now most websites have some form of analytics and it asks for cookies, right? So they can market. So you can get the analytics from the web administration side. So if you own that company and you're trying to build a solution for your company, you have to recon before they recon you. Get it? Seriously, that's the game is to be ahead, right? So suspect what they're going to be doing to you always. So that means that I'm building analytics before they build analytics, right? Mm -hmm. So that way your solution is always going to cover what they're going to attend. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all the time. So uh, one of my friends used to work at the data center and, you know, sometime that I would go there and, you know, on their firewall logs, because, you know, the way that it's visible on screen and he would have like a big screen like this and he would track, right? And it would list like the IP address, IP from China, IP from here, IP from there. That's the, and the number of attacks that happening at the time for his service at the data center. Wow. Yeah. So it's, and the, the things that's blocking, right? So it's doing its job and then the things that it's not able to block. So it's tracking that too. So when that happens is, you know, you're detecting these things. And so you, you want to be able to build out the solution and the combat. Yeah, so sometimes it's, you know, it's hard. It's reality is it's hard for us to catch up and that's that's a problem, that's the downfall. So you wanna build the detection for browsing behavior that's specific to recon, right? Like that's a type of traffic, right? Or information gathering that they're doing. And the tools that's used, it's gonna require a certain service. Okay, you're going to see. Prioritize defense around the technology and the people. And that will be to the individual company or specific company as well. So I, you know, I harp about a lot about the proactive. I think that, you know, if we are a little bit more encouraged to have the proactive solution or the measures, I think that we can go a long way. Um, the downside is that sometimes that can be very costly, uh, resource heavy, right? You have to have the talent to do that, people to maintain it over time. So, so ultimately, you have to be uh you have to hunt threat, right? And when you proactively hunting threat, it's really requiring you to continue to advance, know the tools that they might use, right? Know the threat that could exist or can impact or potentially impacting your organization. So in order to do that, you constantly have to continue building and updating the posture of your security and leveraging the, the nature or having your mature threat model, right? And, and sometimes you bring it to that stage, but then in the future years, it still have to be maintained and continue to do that. So this is why this industry is always demanding people. <laughs> because it's always changing, right? But understanding the, the foundation is going to get you far. Okay. okay. All right. So that would be chapter two. And then it talks about threat hunting here and applying threat intelligence. So I put down the steps, okay? Make sure we know these for CYSA. So recon, recon is information gathering and building intelligence. So they go together, right? That's why I couple these chapters together. I really think that they should be one chapter, 
but it's long. So they broke it up into about 30 page per chapter for the book. And that requires you to use a lot of tools. Okay. For us, it's about tools and also like, you know, knowing the resources to tap into. Um, mapping and enumeration. So there are frameworks and documentation that you can use, right? Testing methodology manual, right? Uh, standards that we follow. But whatever you do, do not do things without what? Permission, okay? We cannot scan without permission, not ethically. The people who are doing without permission is, you know, that they commit a, a crime. You don't want to have a computer crime because, you know, everything we touch and use is computer now right? No more jobs, no more, even applying for a driver license require a computer. So there's open source security testing methodology manual, OS is TMM, such long acronym they use. Okay, so active recon, that means that the system sees you when you see it, okay? And passive recon, everything calls home because when you Snip out packets, it has to send information back to your system. When you're doing trace route, it needs to send back. When you ping, it comes back. Okay. So we have to think about the legality of the scan and making sure the permission. So now if they put out the bounty, I know Tesla a while back put out a bounty to scan their, their uh, website and then you report to them, right? Uh, so they, they reward too. There are Facebook, sometimes they do that. They would see, you know, who can hack this. And if you can hack this, we'll pay you $50,000 or find the bugs, right? Um, sometimes that's a way to recruit. But sometimes it's cheaper to do that than hire real, yeah. real professional, right? But there are professional that are unknown, right? Like they are homegrown talent. Many of my students are like that. They just practice on their own and they just discover tools and they look, they they build their craft. So it's a good way to recruit someone or it's also a good way to, um, what do you call it? A cheaper way to, to solve a problem, <laughs> right? Say, so here it is, the problems, fix it for me, right? Um, so mapping using Nmap or Zenmap, this is a Zenmap on Windows side. Right, you guys probably seen Nmap a lot in in here, and everybody likes using Nmap because it's free and it's easy. Okay, ping is also good. HPing, you can craft packets with HPing or customize how you want your ping to come back. Port scanners, also Nmap and Zenmap. There are many other tools that use port scanner. You can also write Python script to do that. But ultimately, what are the things we need to discover? Host ports, OS, IP addresses, MAC addresses, because OS gives us vulnerability, ports gives us vulnerability, host gives us vulnerability. <laughs> Any questions? <coughs> Something about this room makes my throat like itch. <laughs> okay, so recon. We need to make sure we have written permission, signature, and all. <laughs> Packet sniffer. You can use Wireshark. There are tons of commercial tools that are good. Security plus and then other. Mm -hmm. This is 90% ethical hacking. Yeah. CYSA is 90% ethical hacking. Yeah, when they say risk analysis, it's really ethical hacking and then analyze. Yeah. yeah. So the, 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 the ethical hacking part, you write a report. Analysts, they take that report and they compare it to the existing resources and how to improve, right? Um, but ethical hackers can be analysts as well. So that's a skill for both areas. 
who is you can use specialized search engine metaphor is very popular right it's been around for a long time did you know that Cali, before it was Cali, it was called Backtrack? <laughs> Backtrack. Mm -hmm. So when it became like a Linux release, uh, they would release tools. And the set of tools that you see now, they build it over time, right? Like they pull in the tools from the industry mm -hmm. and then categorize it. But there was Backtrack 5, Backtrack 6. Metasploit was its own. So toolkits exist. They still exist. There are tons of exploit toolkits that's written and rewritten by people and expand. A lot of it is in Python um, or JavaScript, right? So, so these are some of the example only, right? I'm pulling some of the common ones that you probably have seen and use. Dig and host is a very, you know, commands are very useful. Tools use commands. Okay. So with that, right, um, you would see I gave you a list of all different tools. Some I don't put the free trial commercial link ones because you can Google those and fill out the information. A lot of the times I put the link for open source or the procedure on how to use it. Um, Okay, so a lot of screenshots. OS fingerprinting, that's important. That gives us, you know, how OS using the network and also how vulnerable it is. Version of OS is very good to find out. So I put down like I, Angry IP Scanner. That's one of the newer ones that you see. Metasploit OpenVast. This is beautiful on API. Um, when I teach Python for security, if I ever get to teach the class again, if it fills, um, <clears throat> uh, 30C, CIS 30C, it's, su it's supposed to be fall again, but enrollment and the number discussion, but yeah, open mass is a lot of these you can integrate like Nmap. It has an API. Uh, it works well. So you can, you can write your Python script and then you can pull in all those tools. So when you see these suites or these GitHub things, right? Uh, developers just recreate and reuse some of the tools. Even show Don, I show on that too. You can use Python with it. So uh, Tenables, this is, the license is very expensive for professional and business. I think the, there is a free version. Um, the reason why I link this is Nessus is very common for vulnerability. If you scan, uh, just these computers, right? Takes a while because it looks at everything. Okay, so scan takes time. Shodan is really cool. I want to show you this because I'm pretty sure you probably have seen or heard it. Uh, this is a way to find IoT in the world. Your smart camera, your smart TV, you name it. Industrial system, you know, you need to create a login to access their resources. Okay, but this is a search engine specifically for certain things. Okay, so they have, um, and then, you know, yeah, it works with Ruby and Python and PHP and Node.js. Um, some of the information that you can pull could be processed through JSON. So, you know, cool things like what is connected Tons and tons of things connected. Uh, yeah, for for language type to to work with like web things, yeah. Especially, so you can have maps. So Shodan is really cool. If you want to do IoT, this is to start. That's a good start. Um. So for email specifically, use Hunter. Hunter IO. Put in
an email and it finds it finds a twitter account remember this can be used as a weapon but it can also be used as uh no not e email it's it's your your public face so your social media things that you've used that email to register right because for it's a it's a way to streamline the research using that email um so for example if i have a zoom i have a zoom account using mbc email my zoom profile is public it's gonna find it it's gonna find if i tweeted right with an account with that email or things like that so with that it ties the person to the organization and the data for that email right uh, mit did a project it's no longer active it maps all the data that's affiliated with that email and and their network right which is crazy um but you know they don't i guess they just didn't have funding to support a a, a big chunk of it your book talks about it but i when i looked at it they kind of phased it out in 2019 um so it's not active anymore what if you find your job and you use like a newer email like that has nothing really attached to it can they still find that older email attached to you uh sometime yeah they they use online tools and resources that will find your profile which is your name uh, now they have really great ai for a lot of stuff so you know uh sometimes you know you can give it a picture and it will find things that are online like i've found stuff that people deleted like well or things like you know how picture that you posted at one point and then you removed it right uh but some server is still serving it right so you know if you dig long enough you will be able to find it so that's how like some of the forensic people they're still able to find things because server backs up other servers so right, yeah. yeah and then sometimes you can get permission to access it too so i know like my female experience with just like the um it goes through and it tracks like my personal information that I gave it and goes through the notification like your email was compromised on the dark web. Yeah, um, I think a lot of the re credit reporting engine and also, um, you know, if your email, so basically if your email was sold, your account, your profile was sold on the dark web or exchanged in a list, uh -huh. it would show up. So basically it goes out, it sees if it's ever, in a file or something out there. Yeah, um, you know, there are services that you can use to be able to, you know, remove it. You will pay for that service, but you know, how effective is it? Not not really, because once it's already there, it's already me. So, yeah. So let's do NS lookup, and then we'll start with the, we'll work on the lab too. We'll finish, oops. I need to do Microsoft here, CMD. So when you use a uh, command prompt, right, um, you can also use NSLOOKUP in your Linux system. So you would just, you don't need the www. You just need the domain information. So NSLOOKUPMicrosoft.com. And again, you can't just look up all the people, all the domain, right? Some domain is blocked. So this is your public information uh, and it gives you the IP version four, right? Microsoft owns blocks and blocks of IPv4 address. When people ran out, Microsoft still had some. So, you know, they monopolized on that for a long time. You know, surprisingly, I was, long ago, I was teaching IP addressing to my class and I was telling them, I looked up like who owned a big block of it. Coca-Cola owned some, right? <laughs> And then they sold some. Microsoft own a lot too. So Microsoft.com, um, these are the non-authoritative answers for the IP addresses. So when you do this part, you can input it, type it in, or you can screenshot it. Okay. And then what I want you to do is um you you need to put in the the query. What we're querying is uh we're querying for Microsoft Exchange. Okay. So we would do NS lookup, right? But then we're going to do an option or a switch query equals, right, MX. And what you want to do here in specific is you want to look for Microsoft Exchange. 
server information. So it tells you that the public server address is this, right? But if you look before, it didn't give you that, right? This is specifically for the exchange. And the preference here, zero is the least and the 10 is the highest, right? Um, and then it gives you the details. So they do use a protection service or, you know, a solution for Outlook.com. Oops. So it tells you what priority level of MX record, 10, right? And zero is for routing and one zero is used for validating the ownership of the domain. So that means that Microsoft owns that Microsoft Exchange server. Sometimes people don't, right? Sometimes that's owned by another entity. So that routes to another company. So when you configure the DNS and the exchange, you put in that value that comes from the configuration. So we know a little bit more about their mail server, right? By doing that, just one line. So I like, basically, I wanted to see how effective an IT company is if they deliver security solutions. And my YouTube video is going to be up and they, if they do see it or somehow they get a hold of it, they're probably not going to like it. So basically, I wanted to see like, what can I find about this company by just visiting their website, right? That's what I normally do. Just go to the website, look around, and then sometimes traverse through their stuff and see, right? So how much information is out there? This company is near us, not in California, but okay. So company information, right? They give you a lot. This is good for marketing. You can tell that this is really designed for the marketing aspect. <laughs> my company, just my contact information. Sometimes not even that. <laughs> if I don't want to get client, I just remove my information, right? Because not, not a lot of information. All right. So uh, there are some additional stuff. Then you click on clients. There's some testimonial videos. There's some information that's for, you know, business to business. So they do have a lot of partners. And I think there's also a page for partners, right? Um, but you know how I found them though? I just find them by just simply Googling, like about company information gathering, simple as that, right? And it serves me, which they do a good job in, you know, Google tag these things for the crawlers to do that, right? Um, and then if you go, you know, you can go back home. So I want you to take a look and if you can answer some of my questions that I put on there. So this is the type of service they do in IT. It's also good. Maybe get a job there, right? They're in Oregon. <laughs> oh, they have facilities and all over. So I asked you to put down the name and the industry type, the locations, and we're doing passive information gathering. Um, it's all over the web. Organizational hierarchy, if you do see, you don't have to list all of them. They have tons, but if you, you know, you can list some of the titles, like who's the highest and so on. Um, you know, the ones that you want to focus on, right? financial people, executive like CEO, decision makers, um, partners and clients, any big league in there, right? Uh, because that might lead you to, sometimes your target is actually the partner and the client. And then you have to track it back to the affiliated people. Are they on the stock market? Uh huh. They're uh, yeah. They're. So wouldn't they pass through all this? Yeah, you can find financial information on SEC website. 
yeah, financially quarter quarterly they have to report to SEC. So if they are publicly traded, right? Um, it might be under a group though. Sometimes that you know they they get group in like a bunch of tech company because sometimes investor would do that, right? Um, so they would have, yeah, this size. Probably, yeah, it's publicly traded, so they they can continue support. So they probably start out small, and then they scale out, and then they would find investor to to fund them. So they would have board board members, uh, things like that. So you have clients, you have leadership, you have experts. There's people for specific things, right? There you go, there you go. I don't want to. <laughs> Lots of stuff. All of the stuff we teach here. Okay. It's a good size company. Probably a really good company. They've been around for a long time, so they survived the up and downs. Then their case studies. <clears throat> Okay, so put down some information. <clears throat> so when you recon, right, sometimes just visiting the website like that. Sometime you need to look at the source code. So I put down public www for you. I had gone through my list last night and then I was like, what else can I get on, add on here? You want to look at wireless stuff? Look at Wiggle. Um, also compromise email like what you told me before this mm -hmm. is where you can find it so now you can tell people that you know uh, give me ten dollars i will find out <laughs> if your email has been compromised just tell me <laughs> and it's simple search they have search engine for this <laughs> yeah exactly buy me lunch i'll do it for you you don't have to pay for somebody a hundred dollars i'll do it for ten <laughs> hustle right People also is a good source to do stuff for fishing. <laughs> um, and then, you know, your common tools. Uh, if you took 27A with me, you heard of Network Miner, really good for forensic. Um, Colasaw, I've learned, I actually sat in a seminar with the person um, who does a lot of tutorial for Wireshark. She's like best friend with the creator for Wireshark. Um, she illustrated a little bit on Colasoft using a uh, network scanner like Wireshark. Kismet been around for a long time as well, too. But Kismet is really cool, right? Uh, if you learn how to use it, maybe we'll integrate it for this class. And then TCP dump, we use a lot of this in, in most of like security classes too. But you can use TCP dump on Linux and WinDump on Windows, right? So, so those are some of the scanners. Um, and then I added, well, these are kind of different. I, you know, I just didn't want to add a bunch of text. So census is a little bit different than Shodan. Zoom eye is different and gray noise is different. Some of them are kind of like the opposite. So let's, let's look at it. We're almost done with the lecture anyway. So. You know, all of this, they're all, uh, oh, why? Go back to home. I probably linked <laughs> so the wrong extension. Um, you know, so they have solutions and things like that. Right. So there's an area of it that you can actually look at um, the IP list. Okay. And everything that's IoT has a, a, a public IP, right? Um, so that will probably be good too. So look around, you know, automate threat hunting. I think they have an API thing on GitHub as well. And then other cool stuff, right? Look at Zoom I. Census, um, it's actually built into the suite that we're using today. So I'll show you. It's a script. Wi-Fi cam, right? Certain ports. <clears throat> you can tell that, you know, 
they did they tried to do the GUI pretty good then it's in other languages um there's manuals there's tools you can use pro it's pretty new okay So developer realized that people don't use app as much as they use search engine. So now they just do stuff with search engine. Okay, any question? So for the last part, how can you prevent active reconnaissance, right? That's really transparent. Um, you need to limit external exposure of services by knowing the footprint externally. Like, how can they get to your organization, right? Via the internet, but how, right? What is exposed on the public side that's going to damage? That's that's the, the hard part. Um, because sometimes we have to disclose things publicly, like financial information. Uh, use IPS, so your prevention system you need to configure it to limit or prevent probe, okay? A lot of the filter and the, the rules needs to, to be added. And that, you know, we need to, we need to whitelist, right? Versus blacklist. Blacklist sometimes is harder to control because that changes all the time. You need to monitor and use some form of alerting system. So a lot of the security tools that you see today um, like CM and other areas, some of them are all in one, right? The capability and the features, you have to know what those are and how they, it's going to combat the need that you have for your company. Okay. Any question? Okay, so submit that. If you're done, now we're going to work on the lab. And if we don't get to finish, we'll finish it. I'll, I'll change the due date. Let me stop share. And then I'm going to switch. So give me a second. Let me configure my security on Zoom. All right, so now um, let's talk about lab. This one. So we're gonna use Kali Linux if you have it from last week. If you have it from last week, you're welcome to use it. If it's not working, you can always download it. It takes a minute. You need to extract it. So what I did was I downloaded it because they wiped my computer clean. Um, and I, I did back it up. So. And then I, whoops, PC, that's my mic. It still shared the screen, so. Um, and then what you can do is, so to really help the scan before you, before you load it, what you can do is you can up the processor, right? So before I start it, um, I'm going to go here and I'm going to click add. And then I browse to my downloaded extracted folder. And I would find my VBox file, which is the blue file, right? Um, so I open VirtualBox. Let's do that. So search for VirtualBox, open it up. Then once you are in the application, you are going to click machine add and then hit cancel here. If you're at school, you're just going to go to your downloads folder, right? After you extract, you should find an unzip folder, open it subfolder, get your VBox, click open. Don't start it yet, right? Um, Go settings. And then what you do is here on the system, you are going to click system processor and you can up it to four. Some of you knew this because we needed this for 27A. And then you can also up the RAM by going to the motherboard and up the RAM. This is like the BIOS of it, right? 
So I had once ran a VM inside a VM inside a VM. Uh, yeah, well, so some of the simulator is actually using VM and you're going to see that today. Um, or, you know, some of the standard actually using a virtual machine inside your system. Um, for Python environment, that's how we run some of the script is through the virtual machine. Um, so I had simulated the, the, the network using a virtual machine and inside it, I, I turn on a system that uses a virtual machine. So three level. Okay, start. So let's talk about what we need for the lab. Oh, it's just bother me. My thinking am I? So Kelly and Kelly is the plugin. K A L I K A L I out of the box plugin. Okay, we need to use the terminal. And with this, what we have is back here. So I give you a little bit of information about threat intelligence. What we'll want to build is we want to use a suite which consists of many tools. Um, you know. The this one they kind of slow down the maintenance on on GitHub, so I did my best. And their their stuff is kind of you know the the instruction is pretty good. It gives you some example and things that you can refer to and use case. Um, but there are other resources online that are available for KIS. So it's like an all in one tool if you need a scan. Okay. So you are gonna to need to do sudo su that allows you to be a root user once you're logged in. And what it's gonna do is gonna pull a Docker. Um, think of it like a container where it's gonna be able to build out some of your tools for you. And it's gonna use that container to run the application, okay? We can also tie the Docker to like cloud-based. So, this particular, so you pulling data and the way that they created this is they have to handle massive data that's coming in, right? Um, Sometimes you might not be successful using those tools, but that's okay. So we have a group of tools, so you don't have to sit there and run one by one. You just run them all at once. That's my whole goal in this is to show you that you can do things a little bit more efficient, right? So what you need to do is when you're going through and you're issuing the command, uh, you are first going to be able to get the image and then you're going to set it up. But you need to have a database to manage your data that's going to come back, okay? So it's best that we would have the file for our Postgres database okay so after today if you feel comfortable using this tool you can put down on your resume that you have knowledge of right kis or your cali intelligence you know system and in that you would have sub tools okay so i downloaded i think you can copy and paste on here because it's very particular about all the symbols and things that we need to build. You can type. Okay. So I'm gonna do sudo su. Kelly is the password. Then I become root. That's how you elevate your privilege. Then you are going to use Docker pull, Docker IO, the latest. So you are going to pull this. I try to use some of their other stuff. Uh, okay. So 
so it's gonna install uh let's see app install docker pool so let's do app install docker first if it gives you this then just install docker.l Reading okay. packages what happened install do I need to push update? So I have to push. Let's try that first. Oh, I, I promise I tested this three times. Um. Yeah, let's try that. But I, I'm gonna do updates first. All else will go to updates first because sometimes it doesn't have the tools that it needs. Because even when they, you know, when it goes on the website, even though it's pretty recent, it's always good to update. Also, I want to yeah, it tells you to do that. Um. Is it not letting you pull it? Um, installing it that's yeah, it says Docker is not found. So app, let's install it. Docker.io. We're going to do what it says. Yeah. Invalid operation. Let's do the git pull. Sorry. Yeah, I don't want to work OK. You were able to install it? Oh, I had a typo. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yes to install. So app install docker dot IO. Yeah, just do the instruction that it says app install IO. And then you just tell it yes to install. Okay. And then after that, you're going to pull the Docker. Because see how it tells you to run the application. If it's not present, it's going to want to install it, right? Yeah. So make sure that we do, oh, up arrow key. Make sure that we do app install Docker IO. That's good enough. And then what we're going to do next is we're going to pull the Docker now, right? Um, coming back here. We're going to pull the Docker. Always what? Up arrow key twice. Now, anytime that you do this and it's like, you know, it's not complete and it's giving you red, that just means that some either it's they stop supporting some of the download or, you know, go and update. Right, update your Linux. That's usually solve a lot of the problems in the install. Cause Git is pretty good about like you know maintaining it for you know the Debian based system for the right tools and resources. So, so basically, what we're doing is instead of going through and install, downloading each file and do this, we're doing in batch. You see that? So it's it's downloading, extracting, downloading, extracting. That's the nice things about um sweets so as it's doing that um after that you are going to make a folder or a directory called kis because that's the application that you're going to use and you're going to use yaml file yaml is often used for automation um we can put in like configuration settings so what it does is going to plug that into the code of the application. So I can say like, and you know, like my, check yes on this and click no on this. So instead of like going through and install each one like that, we can add the settings into the file to be able to do that. So um, after, yeah, yeah. So after that, what we're going to do is we're going to pull the Git report repository. Right, these are individual commands. 
and this one is a long one. And then we're gonna use the com the composed YAML from the Docker. So he had already created a file for the the application setting um, that's on the Docker. And then you are gonna make a secret file, okay? And then you're gonna update the path, okay, of that secret file because you wanna put it into the directory that you made for your, your application. Then you're gonna start your Docker environment and then you're gonna initialize your database. So it's gonna store your data. Then at that point, it shouldn't take too long. You're gonna take a screenshot. Then um, use help option to get an example of the command. And then you are gonna make a workspace. So your workspace is gonna name new WS. You can name it anything you want. So your engagement, your security engagement could be for like company ABC. And you can say ABC, you know, workspace or, or ABC, whatever right? Um, so what you always start with when you're using this type of tool is you should always have a workspace. So for recon scan, make a workspace. And in that workspace, you're going to build out things like, oh, I want to find information on phone number or email address or names, um, things like that, right? So what the practice in this exercise is giving you the general overall understanding of how to use it at the basic level, but the details in the, the process is workspace. And then after that, use your tools, right? Because the tools, they it needs a workspace to be able to add the data and be able to have, you know, access to the data down the line, okay? And most of this is written to operate with shell. So you are gonna see shell command, like down the line here, you're gonna see, this is Python virtual environment shell. So what they did was they had written a function with that name for the command. So it's gonna be able to find like domain. And I tried to use ethical, right? Uh, websites for attacks. Uh, because, you know, even with that, like we shouldn't do a bunch, lots and lots of scan again. So, so like hack this site, you know, scan me, uh, stuff like that. You can use it to test. Okay. So as you go through, let's see. All right. So it should be done downloading and all of that. So where did we leave off? I think we had done this. And then you're gonna pull the progress Postgres for the database. Postgres is common. Oh. Yeah. And then so I did that, and then now I'm gonna make a directory. You can type it or paste it, it's probably faster. But ideally we would normally, so you make a, and, and, and you can do LSL, right? We learned that last time uh, to list your directory and then you're gonna do a wget. Now, if you're using another version of Linux and it doesn't have wget, you just install wget. It doesn't always come with the Debian release, other Debian release, so. So you can use pull, or you can use wget, or you can use git. Uh, those are the tools that you can pull source code and build those source code as application, okay? So it's telling you here that, you know, if this is for the root, remember that we're operating as root. So when you log in as a user, this thing doesn't exist, okay? Because it's to the profile. So what you wanna do is you might want to use this as a, a, you know, a virtual machine for that test and then don't use it on a regular Linux system. <laughs> All right. Um, and then after I had pulled the raw source code, I'm going to go ahead and make my secret file for my database. Okay. 
no error is good because we're simply copying and pasting. And then we update the path. So when you look at the, the website, the tutorial on the website, it's mostly okay. Um, there are various places that you have to go in and dig around and find like instructions on how to use it. I try to read their documentation and I was like, oh, I, I think I, I need to look at their use case to be able to pull some of the stuff um, for you. So it's fairly newer tools. Okay, now after I got the YAML file and all of my secret files set up, then I can start my environment. Remember that this is a Python tool. Most of them are Python and it's gonna run Python virtual environment. So when you see, um, yes, the, the parentheses, yes again, um, you know, E, E V E E V N V is like the virtual environment. Uh, microcode upgrades kernel seem to be update. No containers need to be restarted. User sessions are running. No user session are running. So it's saying that there's no services started. We're brand new, so we're fine. And then you're gonna initialize the database. Let me see. Oh, it's not, it's doing that again. What did it have? A oh, hypervisor, Kimu, binaries for the host. I thought I fixed this problem yesterday. Let me re restart the environment. That's the problem with security tools. Sometimes, sometimes it works. And then when they update something, that could cause it. Yeah, try it again. So try the prior command, the, the start the environment. If you're getting the no user error stuff like from the prior that you probably have to restart the environment and run the Docker uh, database stuff. Yeah, it should not have any error. I spent a lot of time fixing that area. Like this is one of the ones. Oh, yeah. So take a screenshot when we got that going. Um, I just want to know that you did it. And then we're going to access the help option. So when you're using this, you're using it in a Docker. It's just a container. And then, um, so it is an executable, right? And this is it's actually the modules and the package and then the help option. Okay, so... So it's telling you that, oh, this is the basic command that we can use, workspace, database, host service, domain, host name. These are the things that we can find or create. Um, and then the repo for this is here. So the wiki page is helpful. Um, and then there are other links on the wiki page that you can go to to look at the example. So we're going to create, this is a variable, WS and we're going to make it a workspace. So whenever that, for this application, you just, you know, you you call the workspace function here, and then you are going to create it. Some application later on, you're going to see that we're just going to make, we're going to say workspaces create. What? Oh. Uh, exec flag dash i is it not seeing my dash i mm -hmm. unknown Hold on one second. 
to go to this. It should be the same as the last one because we did it here and it worked. Oh, this kind of hard. Yeah. Sorry. All we need to do is go. Probably do the code and the server and those things in the whole section there. Oh, she ran it again. So ran 11 again and 12. Yeah. Hold on. Let me find out why it's not taking that parameter. Uh, Kelly, and I'm going to go to the wiki page real quick. Okay, installing. So we passed the installing if you got through the database. Yeah, you got to redo it a couple of times because. Okay. Oh, no, if, if it's giving you error. Right. Uh, yeah, this is where I got their information. Okay, so once we have that, we initialize the database. That's good. That's how you use the API. Um, where is your use case? Oh. Sorry, I just want to check their parameter real quick. See, it's I don't know why it's not liking the variable declaration like that. Okay. It's also on here. So they're kind of like putting it everywhere. <laughs> okay. All right. So at the end, like let's say if it's scanning and if you want it to stop, you can say Docker stop, right? That's how you can stop the application. Um, but let me verify. We can back up file. Yeah, let's say maybe we can use shell script. Instead of kiss manage, kiss manage dash dash. I'm going to try something real quick instead of using their source code. Okay, so in the shell. I have an error here. This one's UWS. Oh, it's highlighting exec for some reason. Uh, Dr. Exec. 
Okay, let's try that with that one. WS. The front. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Let's get rid of when you do this command right here. You don't need to declare it because I think it gets confused. Yeah, no yeah, no ws equal. Just just Docker exec because I think it texts it as a regular command. I was like, yeah, it's exactly like the last one. I don't know why the exec is highlighted. So it's placing this into a some kind of container and it didn't like that. So, and then we're gonna do this. So I'm using scan me, which is nmap, right? So when you do that step, what that does is you're saying that you're using the application, you're making a workspace. Then you're using that workspace, which is new WS, you're gonna add the URL that you wanna scan. So you have to make a storage area. You're gonna add that information into that storage area, right? So when I do that here, I'm, I'm putting in scanme.org into my workspace. So make sure that whenever you see the dash W, that's your workspace. And whatever you name your workspace, you have to follow it through. Okay. Yeah, this is because we're using all the tools in the suite at once. Okay, so this step, the, the scan might take a long time, right? Uh, and if you abort it early, you're not going to get the data because it's going to go and it's going to look. So this is a, a one-stop shop. Uh, that's why I'm trying to show you this. Otherwise, you can run most of these on Kali individually. Okay, some of them you just install. Wait, there is something funky with auto start. Is it dash dash? It's because Word probably changed it. Oh, yeah, handle? right. It's dash dash. So you know how it's autocorrect. So off dash dash auto start. It should be all of them should be like green, right? Except for maybe two. So if it's running into error, uh, so see how it's telling me cert. So it could be space, right? So what we can do is you can. I think you can take out your these like the 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 slashes. And then go to your DNS. Yeah, see, that's why I don't like the fact that they don't maintain their documentation too well. So even though like the tools can be really great. Um, no, I just removed the, oops, I just removed the slashes, the separator, because I don't think it understand the separator. Yeah, so it, all of your tools should be green, right? So that means that it's able to execute the function that the tools are written to do, right? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, new, new. Oh, take out the dollar sign. It should be your workspace that you name new WS. Yeah. Make sure that you have your workspace name there. Okay. Yeah, so let me show you what I remove. I remove all the slashes, right? Mm -hmm. I changed my workspace name. Make sure that they're double dashes before the auto start, not a single dash, dash, dash. Because 
the the separator here um if you leave them it's there it's not going to understand the next tool okay so you're going to see something like this if you're here then you're successful in in executing all of those tools at once now um we're using quad core right if you enable the quad core and it is they wrote it as a thread pool so each of the you know like it's able to do it simultaneously instead of one tool after the next it is not sequential okay so um yeah i change up the name i remove all the dashes in front of the double dash like the these i took them out I erase them. The backward slash or whatever. Unorganized auto start. Yeah, go back to the and then um, We type the dashes for the start. So it's all double for each and every Yeah, order. every single tool. So those are the sub options. So what you're doing is you're running the executable, which is tally intelligence, right? And then um and then the single option, which is your workspace, and then the double dashes are your so the help it tells you. Those are the sub tools in that suite. So for uh, auto start, yeah, I have, I have it like that. Yeah, it's gonna. Yeah, it's gonna take start. Okay. It's gonna take a bit. We might have to like, you know, uh, bolt it. Yeah, so as you as you as you become more comfortable with like Python and how these scripts are written, you're gonna realize, oh, it's just a, a container that needs to put in there or a parameter that plug in, right? Because the way that they made it is that these tools and you can't you don't have so these are the ones in the suite that we're using. There are more. Right, so we're just using multiple in the suite. So. Professor, big question. When are you going to be teaching a, uh, a, a, a Python class? I am doing, yeah, I'm, I am doing, I am doing 30A online this summer because I had a lot of questions. I did the Costa Rica one, which was not open to everybody because, you know, not everybody wants to go to Costa Rica. So, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to do B, the, we offer B, C, D, E, and it's just like, if we don't fill the Dean close to class. I really fought for this to go because most of you are at the end of your certificate with this class. That's why it went. Because if it did, if that was not a reason, they, you know, he shut down another six student class earlier this week or last week. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it, you know, yeah, thirty A will be open in the summer. I think C is gonna go in the fall. Um, yeah, I'm. I will try to open the other ones. The problem is if I put myself in it, and then I give my classes away, like twenty seven for other people to teach, and then my class get closed down. I don't have a class to teach, so I have to scramble and look for. You know, either they create a class for me because my contract is I have to teach. A full load, which is four to five class, depending on the unit. How did you do twenty seven? Well, you know, so Anderson was doing twenty five and twenty seven. So in the past, that's what happened: is that um, I I would put myself in for twenty seven or twenty five, and then you know, Mister Lawyer would get cancel out of the class. Then I give him my class. Then I would go and I would be, oh, make me a Python class, right? Oh. So I would teach the class. I mean, I, I'm comfortable with teaching Python and I like teaching the 30C because it's it's really my wheelhouse. Uh, 
Well, but that means people can come by just security? Yeah, and the challenge is though, right? Students take it because they want to learn some like sometime transferable to the school that they go to, but sometimes it doesn't fill because not everybody needs it, that. yeah needs that one or or you know they care about cybersecurity. But I think it's always good to learn. So I try to I really try to promote like they even you know I, my fire got canceled. It was all crazy stuff like before. The, Which one? So I had sent out massive flyer just to promote everybody's class that's not filling. And then they were like, they were trying to pull my flyer from the website. There was all kinds of stuff. Is but this program not as like, well known as other programs? It's very well known. Mm -hmm. 25 and 27 max fill this semester. Oh. It's very well known because like I promote a lot of it. Like I go out to the high school, I do a lot of promotion. And I think we have a lot of apprenticeship traction uh it's just the problem is not everybody's in the same path mm -hmm. right like you might need 41a and another person might need something else they might need 40 or they haven't taken 27 to get to 41a so you know for me i don't have a way to you know they probably have a way to look at the report system and look at like how effective it is to open a class when people most need it mm -hmm. but you know you're gonna have if 80 percent of people need it you open the class what about the other 20 percent? they need another class yeah. so you know it's you a capture that 20 percent of like the pool and the challenge is they don't open every single class that we ask like if it was me i open every class and, or we can have people to teach it that's mm -hmm. the the problem too so. well, what about so Riverside had Riverside didn't have a cybersecurity route originally. They were mostly focused in IT when I first came. There were some security courses and they started to build out their network defense stuff when Skip came. Um they adopted some of our things. So yeah, Riverside didn't like it. I have it on recording. Riverside wanted MVC to offer different courses. They wanted to be the sole and person. that's fair right that's fair i think it's fair because that way like we're not even though it's in the same area you're right right you're gonna see that every flavor in every school okay we're different than chafee even though it's like the same end goal and, and when you look at the classes label but yeah riverside will mostly focus on uh cisco oriented certification um Cisco is great. I think it's good to know Cisco. Um, you can have many different certificates. It's good to know AWS. Um, they also have cyber defense and AWS and cyber defense. What's the thing with Cisco? Like yeah, so the traction is I have the 40 series and, and Riverside has the 26 series. Um, I, you know, my perspective on it was that I felt like you don't have to know all of that information about Cisco to go to cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. I didn't certify in Cisco, right? Um, I did certify in Microsoft when I started, but you know, I feel like you don't have to be an expert in one area. You can be, you can have a lot of broader knowledge. Um, I agree with Skip on Network Plus, Security Plus, and A Plus. That's a must. Um, but yeah, so they have focused. They do a lot of like, I think Red Hat certification uh, for Linux there, Red Hat Academy. It's becoming an academy. We are a Cisco and Academy. Uh, I do teach stuff in Cisco. I just don't require um, all of the like four classes in Cisco. I just, have you looked at the price for the certification? And also they are retiring CCNA or they retired CCNA. So that needs to be updated for the next certification. He's he came from field also. He came from industry. He he was actually the manager, the IT, the security people for the district before he transitioned over. He's great. I'm Skip so knows. Glad he allowed me to resubmit the class in general because like we had five projects in the like five weeks. Yeah. And I would like not understand something. And mm -hmm. he had a good thing to resubmit it. Oh, okay, that's, that's good. So yeah, he's, good. he's you know, he understands. Mm -hmm. I work with him on a few things. He's great. Um, 
so yeah i you know we got together recently they just hired they just hired a new replacement and we're looking for our replacement mm -hmm. yes um they had really good candidates for those so i was looking at like the pool it's pretty slim it, just like this field right if you can't find the people to work in it it's really hard to find the people to teach in it right mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> be nice to me <laughs> so that's why i think i get a lot of things yeah, like, be nice to me. <laughs> literally technically it's that like i you know i do you know and that's great i think i want you guys to have options like that too michael okay so at one point right um you can just wait and if it's not giving you any results yeah. right what did you do for the <laughs> when i did it it was about 20 minutes but who knows sometimes here is always so long like i don't understand <laughs> um you know like you can always stop it you can always exit it um you know you can always kill the process but for so this is 19 is another way that you can so take the screenshot for it is now, right? If you don't get to 19, that's fine. So what I'm showing you for number 19 and 20 is when it goes, right, you are going to see, you're already seeing the shell. You can input this in. You're already seeing the shell here, right? For step 20, just enter 20. You're not going to have the data because it's not done pulling the data, but I want you to show what it, to show you what it looks like. So you don't have to do the bash. It's already giving you the shell here. See how that's the shell, right? Or you can issue this bash. It's up to you. You can use Python shell or shell bash. So let's try that. Oh, sorry, maybe I lied. Let's do exit. Just type exit. Right, we're back here. So what it's telling you is it's not done scanning, right? Like we, we're gonna be here for, you know, look at the tools that you're using. So don't be surprised if your data is empty, right? We're gonna look at data, fic fictitious data, <laughs> um, right? But at home, if you try this, walk away, go have dinner, a glass of wine, and then come back or a beer, whatever you like. <laughs> That's, you know, all right. So we're going to open up Bash. Okay, after you exit, you come back to your root and then you're going to enter Bash. See how this is a little different? So you know that this is a virtual environment in Shell. Earlier, you saw how it was a Shell when we exit. See how this is our workspace, right? In Shell, this is their virtual machine for Python, in Shell for the virtual machine. So then you, once you see this, you are gonna enter the KISS report. So KISS has many functionality. It will go find the data for you. You have manage capability, KISS manage, and then all the sub tools within it. So you were using KISS manage to find domain information using these tools. Now you're gonna put it into a report. Okay. We have no data. Remember we terminated it, right? But realistically, you should have something. Oh, wait. <sighs> History report domain. I fix something here. Let me look at the tracer. Did not determine the eliminator for stop iteration. Runtime warning. Oh, it's just giving you invalid range. Ranges must be two integers separated by the A or character. Let me try something here. Oh. The pipe is right. Just must be... Oh, yeah. So the argument, this, it didn't like the, this. Let me remove it. Oh. 
until morning. Sniffing CSV select could not determine the vegan reader. I swear this is So it's having issue with this. Invalid range. Ranges must be two integers separated by. Yeah, so it's not getting, it's not able to get the data and separate the data, but yeah, I. Hmm. not able to do this sort so something is funny with the data i think it started pulling it and then somehow it's not able to parse it into a table see uh yeah i i did try well i did let it scan for a while yesterday and then i did have a little table that came up uh, i wanted to show you that but you should attempt it at home i tested a lot of these steps except for maybe this area, because I have to write the next one here. But um, so this part is to, to pull it from your uh, CSV, which is like an Excel spreadsheet. And then you are going to be able to, to, so it's also having issue with the sort. And so I think what happened here, I'm pretty sure it's this. It's the forward slash or the pipe issue. I gotta go fix the syntax because I think they they changed the command. But anyway, so no point in repeating this, but the whole point in this section is that when you you can put in another domain, right? Just repeat the process, make a workspace, add in the URL, and that's how you can scan. What it can do is you can also add in many workspaces and be able to use different workspaces. Take away the dollars. <laughs> okay, so you don't have to do this part. So just screenshot it for me and I want you to practice it. You have Kali Linux, so you can use it. Okay. This one's better though, <laughs> because it's one tool. So. When, when you're done, right, with this, and it, just exit the shell, so it takes you back to the command line. And then uh, you can screenshot it there, it's fine. You are gonna use recon ng. I have a typo. For the recon ng, this is good for web recon. And, uh, you know, unlike Metasploit, it's slightly different. But if you want to use Metasploit, this is their stuff, right? They said you can use Metasploit. It looks like it. So you don't have to install anything. It comes with Kali. So you just call it. Dash. And G. And if it's a tool, you see how it changes? Dash H. If it says it's not installed, then you can just install it. So the help option tells you that you can, you know, make a workspace just like the last one. You can uh, use without analytics, but analytics sometimes help us. Um, and then, you know, you can make it stealth. So that way it's not visible to systems that are preventing like um, your intrusion prevention system. So it sees it as a threat, right? This is a not, passive scan it's active right so um so we're going to do workspaces create and we're going to give it a name test ws huh. workspace oh Oh, I'm sorry. You have to recon ng again. So 
when you do this, call recon ng, right? Open application using recon ng dash ng. That what that does is it's gonna open up the application, which is the CLI or in shell. Now, if you don't use the CLI, you have to use the, you know, recon ng dash w and then give it a name. You can still use it in command line, right? It works. So if you want, you can start with help, which is the next step. It tells you these are the commands. See, workspaces in CLI is there, right? And then next, we're going to paste the selection, workspaces, and we're going to do create test ws okay it should make a workspace for you and see how the workspace is there so now you inside that container it's all about container and storage right uh, how you access it you are going to use marketplace help what Marketplace does is it's going to tell you all the features, or I mean the modules that you can uh, you can use. So it's telling you the interfaces with the module Marketplace, which is Git, and to be able to do the install, remove, or search. So we're going to do a search. We are going to use Marketplace. We're going to search it. We're going to search for categories of modules so it's going to break it up into, so if you just search in general and doesn't give it a criteria, so what we're doing is we're searching for domain, right, in the marketplace. The modules, so modules are Python files that or script that are created for specific things. So here, uh, what we have is, you know, it tells you that D is dependency, K requires keys. So that means for encryption. So these are sub, some of it, okay? So what we're, we're doing is looking for anything that's web domain related. So that's why we look for domains here, okay? You're like, wait a minute, you told me to search and it's not on here. You have to look through all the way through. So I'm gonna use Hacker Target. And so this is a script or a, an application that is, and you can use it within, so basically I'm gonna go look for it and then I'm gonna download it and install it, right? So when I search, I can find it and then I find the one that I want, I install using Marketplace. So it's like crawling out to the web is Marketplace, okay? In Recon NG. Then um, you are going, once you install it, you are going to load it. So to execute this in CLI for Recon NG, you use modules, okay? And there are really cool stuff on here. So if you have time, go through the marketplace. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna say, okay, now in my workspace, I install this tool and now I'm gonna load the tool. So see how it shows you the path there, okay? And then what we're gonna do is we are going to set our domain source. And so you are gonna put in the options, which is gonna plug that into the parameter of the function for the script. So it's telling me that this is the source, that's your target, right? Remember hacker target? So you are going to say, now you don't have to use domain, right? We can, there are things like name, phone number, Etc. There are other areas that you can use to identify specific target. And we're recon to set up our requirement for our target. So once you have your, your hack the site, um, you are going to show information by using info. Right? 
And it tells you, it says, oh, this is the source of input for the details. <laughs> exactly. Who's the author? And then the version. So it does the NS lookup and all of this other thing for you, right? And then you're going to do an input and then run. We're not ready yet, right? We're going to do an input. We're saying that we're going to take that string, which is your URL that you set up for the source right here. And you're going to use it as an input, right, into the script. And then we are going to now execute the script by running. Yep. So now, right, remember, public information is public. You can use it to scan, right? But, you know, when you started getting a lot of stuff, right, you need to make sure that you ask their permission. So ideal way to practice is, you know, you can have a couple of websites like Scan Me, Hack This Site. There are some stuff that you can, you can just don't floor them. That's what they said on the website. <laughs> I think I did do a brute force um, SSH one time demo for my 30C class and they changed the message on there. They probably saw the traffic, like all my students are, are, are brute forcing <laughs> their web page. Um, I prefer not to teach it in the short term because it has, we go, so there's, we removed the requirement um, because, you know, it allows more students to explore it. However, I have to review and not having the knowledge coming into this class, that class or to taking non-credit courses and going into that class. If it's fast paced, it's really hard. Like, just imagine, like, you barely learn to ride a bike and, like, week two, mm -hmm. and I'm going to tell you, race down the street. You're going to be like, oh, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so in in a six-week session, by week three, you're halfway through the book. So, yeah, I prefer. And it was very fast paced. But the bike can go to the day. Yeah. And and when it's online, I trust that the student go over it every single day, and sometimes they don't. And so it's a struggle. Uh, yeah, programming for the advanced courses, I prefer not to do it. I would do the intro one. The intro one is good for that, right? Like when I did Costa Rica, I have to squeeze everything in less than six weeks because they still have to travel. And so I was doing seven chapter in the first two weeks. And I was like, this is the fastest I've gone in the first two weeks. But, you know, some of that doesn't stick because it's so fast. So, yeah, I, I have my reservation. I do like fast paced class because I came from a quarter system. Yeah. Like, you see the you can go over the That's why, like, I really feel that courses should be in quarter system, but you know, um, uh, ten weeks you can have more courses done. Oh yeah. I and when I got my graduate schools, go through the courses with all quarter systems. Summer times and overlapping sessions, like five weeks summer classes and ten week ones, and yeah. you can take them. Nice. So. After you get your stuff, screenshot it. You can snip it or you can use your typical screenshot with the new feature. Um, <laughs> and then do the show host, which is nice also. It actually breaks down to all the related hosts, which is so beautiful. I love it. <laughs> when you get information, right, for security people who are like, yes, it's something. Um. And it's useful stuff. So I know there's a virtual machine. There's a firewall information. There are so many goodies that I can use, right? I know they're like a benign community that teaches students how to hack. And so like, um, well, we're just getting information. All right. So just give me a count on how many hosts are shown. Now, remember that your target could be different scale. So you might have thousands, right? Uh, but want to focus on your important system. Yes. Your IP addresses right here, those are all the devices connected to that domain. Or, or servers, or related servers. 
So it's easily a, a two dollar SIM card and just go right here. Well, you have to use lots. Right. You have to, mm -hmm. yeah, distribute it. DD DOS. Got the information else. All you need to do is just to do. No, but they have firewall up, so it's gonna it's gonna kick you out shortly. And they DMD it, so you know I'm sure the creator for the website he created it for people to attack it. So I'm pretty sure that they have they have things. So a lot of those are probably backup, and they're using their VM to help. So. You know, you're you gotta do the escape attack to really attack it. But this gives you the snapshot in the topology, sort of. That you have an idea of who's connected. Yeah, it's golden. And then, you know, the ranges, sometimes you would see them and see how they're different. So they're using different networks possibly you know uh segregated um if they are using the same service provider um and you know in my opinion i would use different providers or different networks only because for physical security and also you know for, for redundancy issues right um because if my provider is targeted then i'm done okay C. Yeah, they uh sometimes use irregular things, yeah. so that way it's not. But also, it depends on how you reserve it. This is public, public IP. Yeah, so it gives you the count, which is kind of nice. Yeah, it's parsing the data cleanly. I like it sometimes. Some tools, it's like, oh, you got to use another tool to take the data and clean it, and then another tool to, like, so, you know, it's, and there's always room for improvement, of course. And then it tells, sometimes this also gives you, like, the physical area. So when we've done, so recon is great. This is only one, like I said, right? Um, and then once you're done with this, you can just do, Answer this question, shut down now. So what what can you use with KISS, right? I wanna come back to here and let you know the type of tools that it's giving you. Census domain is census IO. So instead of using the actual website and the tool itself, um, you can, you can, you know, automate it this way. So the good thing about this suite is it, it is automated. Um, you can use it to harvest, right? You can get threats. So it's tapping into all the threat intelligence and other resources like, you know, engines and things like that to pull the data for you. So it's a one stop, right? One stop shop. Now, the downside of it is you got to get it because so many tools are incorporated and you can, you can size this down to like three, right? Because we're just running many. Um, what happened is you gotta wait for it to be done. So the scan is gonna take a look longer, okay? So the difference between a suite and one single application, you can see, right? From one to the next. Recon is about building information, right? Intelligence is about gathering threat or potential threat or system information as well to really build out the, the larger knowledge. So all of this is gonna play into the first stage of attack. Recon is about gathering information. It could be system information, it could be domain information. And then for intelligence, some of that encompasses vulnerability. But in recon, you also want to look for vulnerability. So they're overlapping. So when you're doing threat intelligence, you're also doing recon, right? That's the first step. I noticed that it has virus total. Oh, yeah. That's more so malware, right? Yes. So when you visit the website, you saw that, oh, we only see the first one unless you subscribe to them, of course, right? But on this, what it's going to do is going to pull their database 
and it's going to parse it. So you can use specifically virus total and you're going to ask it to look for certain things. Add the parameter and it's going to crank out what you need, right? So, you know, uh, many security professionals, what they do is they look at the existing tool, how it's written, or use the API and then modify it to their custom. So the longer you go in the field, the more customized tool you have, which makes your life a lot easier because you're like, oh, I'm doing that again. Let's just bring this out, right? So it's like your tool shed, you have a lot of things and then you keep running your tools that you need um, and then editing your tools to hone it better. And I think having a, a set of tools that work and work well for you. And sometimes you run into tools, you're like, oh, this is okay, but you know, I can fix it and make it a little better. Um, I know now what to do with this. Um, instead of running at Docker, I can use CLI, right? Command line is better. So the instruction that they provided is running through Docker, um, but you can also use shell like this, okay? And then you can always go in and say, kiss manage dash H for help or type out help and it will show, it will show you. Okay. So, so it has virus total, which is malware. Does it have any internet of things on the radio? Yeah, so it has census IO on here uh, for domain. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, I threw a bunch of things in here. This is from their use case. Um, have I been breached, right? We talked about that, like your email address is affiliated with the dark web. Um, who is the domain. So there's a bunch of stuff on here. So that's why it's going to take a long time is because there's so many different things that it's looking for at once. But if realistically, if we're doing it methodically, right? If I, I'm, I'm thinking about like, how can I do this effectively and efficiently? You, you would use like who is together, something that's related right. together. So you can parse your data in a group that makes sense. But uh, since I still have my Cali up, it's there. Now, how is it applying virus total? Because that virus total, is it applying to the whole network or is it applying to the, all the it's devices just, under the network? So virus total is a repository for malware threats, yes. right? It also contained database and information on the database linking to that website. So what, what it would do is we're telling it that, is there any malware related to the site? Did it distribute malware? That's the relationship is that, is this, is this a water hole? You know what a water hole is, right? Like they're a fake website that distribute bad stuff, right? Uh, so. That's a way that you can you can scan those. So do we to apply all that and determine for this domain, yes. It's unnecessary for a lot of the stuff that we add on here, but you know the point is to show you guys that you yeah. can. <laughs> if the virus total in specific is going to be a power hat that we go on to the other, all the other for uh for the for the good and the internet of things. Yeah. There are a lot of the ones that are already automated. So they go and check infected site and it reports it to security company and and feeds like this, right? So it tags them or, you know, sometimes it could be behavior based sometimes, you know, so a lot of the security tool commercialized one that you buy, you know, out of the package and you install, you configure, you know, like the ones that have live engineer, I'm not going to mention who, uh, that you pay a ton for, like seven million dollars or something like that. Um, <laughs> so pretty much all software has it just has all. That. Yeah, so it has some of the automated and customizable features that look for certain things to give you your customizable intelligence, right? But you know, it just take a little bit of work to kind of, you know. Open source tools, open source tool. You're gonna have hiccups. You're gonna be like, oh, it worked yesterday and I gotta fix this today. Yeah, because they update something, right? Um, yeah. But you know, you can build, a, like I said, a tool set that would work in general. Okay. 
Well, that makes Linux, Kali Linux, a good one for, they categorize it for you already. Yeah, so what I'm recommending is, you know, when you go home and you run this, just run two yeah. and see, right? And then parse, take the report. You know, you have the documentation and even the creator, he said that just Google my tool and you will find there are a lot of resources that people wrote. I think Recon NG also the same, but on their wiki page, they, you know, they did add a lot of the tutorials. So I pulled this stuff from their wiki page and they use, so it's like three places, four or five places, right? And then I run it through and sometime I had to fix, um, you know, but yeah, as you look at the error, you can go through and take a look at like where you need to fix your command. And then I think they have a manual for the CLI as well. So it's better to use these things as CLI, like what you see with ReconNG, it's way better, okay? So Kali has a lot of these things. So you want to do reverse engineering, they group it for you already, right? Information gathering, all of these things. OSINT is, it's the thing, right? For security analysis. So a lot of the tools we have in that list is part of this, okay? SSL analysis. So when you use Recon NG, you can look for, for SSL only and it will, it will give you that, right? The sub tool. So, and then vulnerability analysis. So after we gather information, we assess this web application analysis, burp suite. That's very common for domain. Uh, it also is good for attacks. Burp, yeah, I, I, I will likely use burp. It has a graphical user interface. It's a very popular tool right now, right? Most, if you just, that's a buzzword, right? You go to an interview and you just throw it out there. You say, yeah, I know how to use this feature in Burp Suite. Oh. You'll be like, they, they'll be like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so um, I had incorporated this in, in Python uh, for one of my class. You can automate it, actually. Oh, great. Let's see. I'll show you where you can find information. We still have a little bit of time. But I'll take attendance before you go. There's um YouTube tutorial and Udemy and you know tons of stuff. I know Udemy. You do? Yeah. Like Jason, Jason G has guys like Oh okay. Yeah, some some people are great at content creator for education. This tutorial is very concise, that's why it like filters a lot of the expert stuff. Yeah, so Swigger is you know the creator for this um you can use this for injection scanning this is the tool to know right they have an academy and all of that good stuff um their stuff is through on github so source code and all i think for i don't know about the extra stuff that you buy here but um great great tool to know let me see if they have um Yeah, they do have their own set of things, right? Labs and, but let companies pay for this. But get started, go here. Oh wait, this is the learning solution. I think you can use the community version. Uh, this is good for security testing. And then you just have to give them your email. Or when you create a login, I, you know, when I use the API, you have to have a login, okay? It's gonna, you can write Python and then you can also use the UI on this. Master.
So they have some good information. All right, see, it's used in 16,000 organizations. That's just one area of the, the app. And then you can uh, go through set up and use for free. So they talk about that. Okay. So in the future, Let me take attendance as it comes to the close for today. If you're done with both of the things, you can submit. If not, you can turn it in later. It's not due to the end of the week. I don't know what's going on with Gabriel. Is he working during the day? He's still in this class. So. Oh, okay. Thanks. Just send him an email and let him know what we're doing. Oops. Okay, Fonza, if you have any question, let me know. So more stages to come. I did do so much studying for your report that um that Jason and I have done a great report instead of the grade.